Fan Monday Morning Racer here once again. We've got another special interview for you on Drag Racing TV, which again brought to you by Strutmasters.com, the suspension experts. Why? Because we're all under this Corona lockdown. But Alex Laughlin, he's found himself to Fort Worth, Texas, there in the Elite Shop. Man, look, where are you at? Talk to me about that beautiful facility you got there behind you. Yeah, so this place is the Elite HP. Uh, call it the headquarters. Um, basically, cars, race cars, uh, parts, everything in between. Uh, Richard Freeman sells it all right out of here. And uh, basically how it works, as you know, with uh, Elite Motorsports, they sell a ton of race car rigs, motorhomes, toter homes, trailers, and whatnot. So a lot of the times, Richard will actually buy like a complete turnkey race operation. The rig will show up here unload all of the engines, cars, projects, whatever's in the trailer, all the, the cars and parts get parted out here and sold. And then the rigs go back to Winniewood and uh, the, the big stuff gets sold from there. So right now I've got probably, I think probably 14 cars down here. A lot of the cars are rolling back in from uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, a lot of them were shipped over there uh, back right after Pomona last year for that big, uh, big car deal that they had over there. And uh, everybody, everything's showing up, got to recharge the batteries and clean it up and it's all uh, getting ready to be sold again. And there's, there's some cool stuff. There's, there's a lot of stuff down here that uh, I would love to have myself if, if I had an extra buck or two. Definitely, it all looks cool, man. It looks like I'm eyeing. It looks like a blue Nova sitting down there. There's a red Fox body, you know, beautiful square body Chevrolet truck there. So some nice rides, nice, nice wheels are sitting down there. So is that place an appointment only place? Is it open to the public? How does it work? More than anything, it's online. Um, but yeah, it, people can show up, check the cars out. Uh, like I said, there's everything from like a GT2 RS Porsche. Um, we've got a Texas mile car down here. It's a 69 Camaro that's been 215 miles an hour in the standing mile. And then you've got RVW cars, there's pro mods, there's, I mean, literally everything, golf carts, toolboxes, everything. If you need a racing operation, it sounds like Elite HP is the place to go to go get it. Now, you're a Texas boy. You're there in Texas, and apparently from how you describe it, you're out in the middle of nowhere for your hometown where you're living. Look, what has lockdown been for you in the Laughlin house? Uh, how many times have you had to chase the parrot down and things like that? Yeah, it's been a lot. Uh, the, the bird and the dogs have definitely uh, they've enjoyed the quarantine time. Uh, you know, I've been working from home a lot um, just between from my computer in my house um, to working in my shop. Um, and then I spend, you know, I come over here to the Fort Worth shop once or twice a week. I've uh, been up to even the race shop in Oklahoma, you know, trying to trying to stay as local as possible. But on some level, you know, I still got to get out of the house and get some fresh air. Definitely, definitely. Look, is it as crazy as I imagine it owning an exotic bird like a parrot? I mean, the parakeets, I know the ones with the fluffy hair on top or feathers, but they just seem berserk and wild and like I don't know why anyone would own one so is a parrot similar or are they a little bit more chill what's it like you know that's a good question I've never thought about it but since you since you bring that up I, I would say that you could almost compare it to a, a dog or dogs because they all have different personalities you may have a dog that just barks and goes crazy all the time and you've got some that are just completely chilled and laid back and uh, my bird Malcolm he's he's chilled and laid back for the most part He'll, uh, he'll throw a scream in there every now and then, but for the most part, he's good and just just hangs out. You know, we don't clip his wings or anything so he can fly around the house. Uh, so that's kind of crazy, but you always have to have paper weights and stuff because if you have any any papers out on the bar top or anything, it's, it's going to go flying. Fascinating, fascinating. So they're flying cats, basically, and they're focusing on the papers. Stellar, awesome. <laughs> now... You, let's talk a little bit about racing. We're going to get to drag racing, though. I first want to ask you about this deal with uh, Hot Wheels. Obviously, you're sponsored by them. You've got a great relationship with them. But are you going to make a serious attempt at trying to break 
Joey Logano's record, 1,941 feet. That's the record. Are you going to make that attempt? So I don't, as of now, I don't even have enough track to do that. But the deal with, with Joey's track, it was, it was really cool. And if you watch the whole video at how many times they failed, you know, every single car is different. They weigh different. Um, even on my track, I've got 200 feet of track on the floor right now. And you can run the same car down the same track. And the first feature that it comes to is the double loop. Sometimes it makes it just fine. And sometimes it, it doesn't, you know, and it's literally the same car every time. So some of it's luck and, and it's just, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge overall. And that's, that's the Hot Wheels motto really is challenge accepted. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely teaches kids whether they believe it or not or or consider it or not that you know you're gonna fail and a lot of times you're gonna fail more times than you succeed so uh you have to you have to you know become content with failure and, and be able to build from it and uh and grow well man look i think you need to accept the challenge because you're the hot wheels dude you need to have that record yank that thing from joey it needs to be in drag racing with hot wheels long-standing relationship with drag racing and drag racers as yourself man let me dive in a little bit to your racing background i've watched a lot you've explained it to a lot of folks i mean there's been carts legends tractor pulling pop tracks there's pop alcohol now pro stock pro mod i mean a little bit of everything so i want to ask first let me ask a little bit about the carting i know you've been at daytona how crazy is it to be butt riding on the asphalt on the high banks for the full road course? And what's that sensation of speed and competitiveness with your other karting individuals? So the first time I ever raced D uh, Daytona in a kart was back in probably 2012 or so. And the first time I pulled out on the high banks, I mean, they, you can imagine, you can tell you know, that the, the, the track is extremely sloped. If you've ever had the opportunity to, to walk out it or climb up, you know, the sides of Bristol or anything, um, there's no doubt that it's super steep. And the first time I pulled out in a go-kart, I actually felt like if I were to slow down any, I could literally just turn over and roll down it. Um, you know, after being out there for, you know, several laps and whatnot, it, it, is, uh, it does become a lot more comforting but it is crazy. I mean, we're in a, in a go-kart, you know, that's, that's a single cylinder engine makes, you know, right at like 30 horsepower, but it runs, my cart does, you know, close to 125 miles an hour out there. Uh, it's a shifter cart, it's a, uh, a Honda 125 and they, they fly, turns 15,000 RPMs. And, uh, you know, we race for 30 to 45 minutes at a time and it's an absolute blast. Yeah, I mean, those carts, people, I don't think they realize it is a extreme form of motorsports, I really think, being so open, exposed, going as fast as you are. And people take karting seriously. I mean, you know, F1 guys will oftentimes race back down the ranks into the karting levels, and they still absolutely enjoy it. I've got to ask this. So in the American flat tracks circles, like when they're at a big mile track, the draft comes into play, even with a motorcycle. So at Daytona, even on a cart, is there a bit of a slingshot application with the draft? I wouldn't say there's a bit of it. I would say there's a whole lot of it. Um, it that makes up everything. That's the difference in uh, 2,000 RPM almost uh, whenever you pull out of the draft. If, uh, if you don't have a drafting partner, then the people that do are just going to leave you behind. Um, Back in 2018, December of 2018, um, I had a decent start. I ran uh, in the top five for the entire race. And the, and the deal out there is you don't want to be in the lead on the last lap because you're going to get passed. And so I positioned myself perfectly. There was a lot of strategy to it. And I came up on the last lap in second place. And right before the finish line, you know, you can see the finish line about a quarter of a mile ahead or even further. And so I let the guy ahead of me get about 15 to 20 foot ahead where I'm still just barely catching the draft. And I just timed it perfectly that, you know, I stomped back on the gas and wound that thing up and literally slingshot it uh, within about five feet of the finish line. I came by uh, and won by about a full 
cart length and uh, without the draft, you know, your, your lap times are, you know, when we're talking carting, a tenth of a second is astronomical. And if you're not in the draft and you're by yourself, you could be two seconds down per lap. Man, that is wicked cool to hear the draft plays that much of a part in carting at Daytona. Folks, if you've never been to Daytona and seen anything on the road course, you've definitely got to do it. See the carts there and see how spectacular it is for people that, well, if they're throwing out, they're like rag dolls and they're going over 100 miles per hour using the draft. That is stellar. Now, you also done some legends racing. And, folks, we're going to talk about drag racing in a few moments. Don't worry. But I want to make sure you understand that this guy has been a wheel man in a lot of different things. So, legend cars. I've seen that be pretty cutthroat. Back home at Anderson Motor Speedway, I've seen guys try to make four wide in the turn one and a guy gets sent out into the parking lot. Look. In Legends, what was the craziest thing you had ever seen and experienced? Well, I actually, I raced Legend cars for like two and a half to three years, something like that. And it was it was typically always asphalt oval. I did uh, run a dirt race once at Texas Motor Speedway. It was the weekend of the NASCAR race, and I had a car set up to run the asphalt oval um, inside the big track. We followed NASCAR. Um, as soon as they finished their race, we rolled right out. So the stands were still full. I was like 15 years old and that was awesome. Well, that night was the dirt race and that's one of the biggest dirt tracks. It's definitely the biggest dirt track I've ever been to in person. Um, I don't know the exact length of that thing, but it's, it's gigantic. And so, you know, we'd run probably 120, 130 miles an hour in a legend car out there on the dirt. And, uh, it was like nothing I've ever experienced before. I didn't really have much practice or anything. And I, I was running okay, middle of the pack. And I got I got hit going through a turn, went up and hit the wall and barrel rolled it. And uh, man, whenever I got out of it, you know, I was shaking a little bit, but the firefighters flipped it back over on its wheels. And uh, I started it up and just did a burnout all the way across the finish line and pulled it off the track. But the chassis was bent and it was, it was destroyed, but I promise you that the, the crowd cheered louder for me than the guy that won it. <laughs> well, folks, we now know that Alex Laughlin has definitely rolled something, and he's been through a few things in his motorsports career, which has been since you were nine years of age. You're, what, 30, 31 now, so definitely been behind the wheel for a long time, a lot of experience. Let's talk about the experience down in Orlando very briefly because you were the only one doing double duty. Obviously, you had a stellar World Door Slammer Nationals with the Pro Mod car and the Caruso family winning the race, but Pro Stock wasn't that bad. If I remember, you did get past first round. Talk to me about Pro Stock at the World Door Slammer Nationals. Really, um, I'm going to say that Pro Stock and Pro Mod were completely inverted on our performance. Uh, we started out with a really good uh, pro stock car and qualifying um, everything was good literally through every single round of qualifying we had uh, one of our older engine setups in the car um, everybody has new stuff elite has actually um, they've come out with some new updates and everybody else's car um, really responded to it well for some reason mine didn't we put the the new setup in the car on the last round of qualifying and we were just we were just slow and we couldn't figure out why you know i did get through first round um it was still slow though and we put the uh the other setup back in the car but with that you know we were just a little bit behind the eight ball we didn't have a good tune up you know for the engine we were putting back in the car and so i ended up losing second round by just i think like four thousand it was it was a really tight race um but uh the, the pro mod you know we started out struggling through qualifying um, and then progressively got better. And every single run that we made on race day in the Pro Mod also got better and better all the way to the final round. So with Pro Stock, let's talk about the two NHRA events that we have got in the books because the Door Slammer Nationals, though NHRA rules, was not a national event. Pomona, Phoenix, really possibly the tale of two different types of races for you. Talk to me where you think the team is right now, even though we're waiting under lockdown concerning NHRA national events and running for a championship. You know, um, 
I, I almost wish this would have happened last year because I was in second place in points for literally the entire season. I had a rough run in the countdown and I went from second place uh, to, uh, to eighth. Um, this year, because of what's happened with the coronavirus and whatnot and the races that are canceled and or postponed, there will not be a countdown this year. So from here on out, it is completely game on. And so you can't afford to, to have any slip ups uh, from here on out. We ran good in Pomona and then we ran good in Phoenix as, as well. Um, I should have been in the final in Phoenix. Um, I was running against Bo Butner and you know he got loose out mid track and ended up having to push the clutch back in. Didn't make a good run at all, but uh, my car uh, broke the drive shaft, which is not common in a pro, pro stock car. It went into a little bit of tire shake and you know I tried to pedal through it and, and uh, go ahead and grab second gear and just the tire was on fire. And you know after shifting and getting all that extra ratio, it just became completely violent. And that's what essentially broke the drive shaft. So basically all I had to do that run was just go A to B to get into the final to, uh, to be able to race against my teammate Erica. But, you know, things happen. And uh, just, just like I was saying with the Hot Wheels stuff, you know, you can, you can try it a thousand times and you may fail, you know, 999 times. But the reason that you keep trying is because you will eventually get it. And, uh, you know, whenever we get back out on the track again after all of this settles, we will still be um, as competitive as we were, no doubt. Um, there's also no doubt that we are, you know, making the, the most horsepower out of anybody in the pro stock category right now. Um, and uh, I'm ready to get back on the track and, and just can continue the beat down. <laughs> definitely, man. I know Bo Butner mentioned to me in interviewing him that he definitely lucked his way all the way to the final. He should have been out every round that day uh, from – round one to the final. So he definitely had a good race. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, as they say. Now, with getting back to racing, I'm curious, has the elite team, have y'all been talking with, you know, right now potentially Gainesville is going to be the first weekend in June? That may change. We don't know. But are y'all talking about possibly doing some testing before Gainesville, you know, kind of knock the rust off again off of what has become a mini off season already? You know, as of now, we haven't really talked about it just because we don't really know when the next race will be. I know that, you know, they've got the early June race on the schedule. You know, we've heard through the grapevine that they're going to push it out all the way, you know, as far as the U.S. Nationals. That may not be true, um, but there's, there's definitely signs even from, you know, the president of the United States that, that this thing is going to be drawn out a little longer than, uh, than what we're thinking e even now. Um, so to be completely honest though, on, on testing, as I, as I sit right now, I am absolutely tapped out on a funding level. And so I will have no choice, but to sit out until we do get to Gainesville. Um, the fact that they have cut a couple of races off the schedule has helped me tremendously, uh, because I was actually short funding on about four races so far, um, two being gone. I look at that, like, that's just two less that. I have to pay for. Would I love to run those races? Absolutely. But again, with no countdown, I can't afford to miss a race or I'm, I'm not going to get the points and I'm going to be out of, you know, the run for the championship, you know, no doubt. So um, testing is expensive. It, it costs a ton of money to get the rig somewhere, to unload, to pay your guys. And, uh, you know, the, the engine lease and whatnot is an astronomical fee. Um, so I'll probably be sitting out at least until Gainesville, um, but I'm not really that worried about it. Uh, we've got tires that are broken in. We ended on a good note there in Orlando, and we'll be ready either way. Sounds good, man. Sounds good that y'all be ready either way whenever we do get back to racing. When we go back to racing, have, we have uh, mentioned here in this interview, the point system will be a bit different because it's going to be a straight run to the championship. Consistency is going to matter. We kind of go an old school through all of this. With that being the case, let me get your thoughts on the countdown and how things have been going. What are your thoughts on it? Are you in favor for it? Would you rather run every year on a consistent consistency-based 
format? Would you like to see bonus points for winners and things of that nature? What's your thoughts on it? Yeah, you know, that goes either way. You know, last year I would say that, you know, and I said the countdown was stupid. I had a list of reasons of why I, I thought it was. Um, it just depends on where you are whenever you get there because all the way up to Indy, you know, I had I had as good a shot as anybody as to win the championship. I joke with Erica and say, you know, that I won the big race, uh, Indy, and she won two little races and, and ended up winning the whole championship. But it just depends on where you are. It, it, you just have to be hot at the right time, and that's all it comes down to. So I can complain about the countdown uh, format, the, the way that it's been for the last several years, um, depending on where I am coming up uh, towards the end of the season this year with no countdown. I may be wishing that, that the points did reset. So all in all, it just depends on, you know, where you are at that time. Sure, sure. It, uh, you know, other drivers have mentioned, hey, there's been years I've hated it. There's been years that I have loved it. It's definitely going to be interesting to see on this now consistency-based format who is going to come away with the championship. They'll be the true champions for years on out, people will be naming them. So, man, you need to step up and grab that big wally for the championship. Definitely, definitely. Look, what about the health of Pro Stock as a class? You mentioned even with the 18-race schedule, that you were still looking for some funding for some other races. You know, right now, fans, for whatever reason, I feel like there's a disconnect with the pro stockers, even though I, I love pro stock. It's one of my favorite, if not my favorite class. But you, we do see right now that after fuel runs, people leave the stands. They go back into the pits, and they don't hang around. What are your thoughts on the health of the class? What can improve it? Is it less races? What do you, what's your thoughts on it? There's, there's a couple different aspects to that. Um, one being that the fans just, you know, in the nicest way, aren't educated on what pro stock is and what it actually takes to make those cars do what they're doing. Um, the people that do stay and watch are the people that do understand the class and, and appreciate it. Um, but the people, the people that don't, Hey, I totally get it. The cars don't go 300 miles an hour. They don't blow up. They don't, you know, shoot fire out of the headers. And, and it isn't just, just a crazy, um, you know, out of body experience. Um, but with that being said, whenever the people do understand it's 500 cubic inches, it's naturally aspirated. All of the restrictions that were under in the car still do what they're doing. And you've got people like the KB guys, the, the summit guys that, have completely different technology right across all these different um, engine programs and we're still racing so close you know races are won or lost by you know sometimes a thousandth or less of a second and uh, you know whenever people really start to understand exactly what goes into pro stock that's when they appreciate it uh, more than anything so do you think that appreciation comes about through the education? Is, it, is that education done by the NHRA? Is it done by the racers and the teams? Who, who's responsible for that, do you think? I think that there's so much to talk about um, in pro stock to make that goes into making the cars do what they do. Um, there's a lot that NHRA has at their fingertips just right there that, that they could take advantage of that they don't. Um, they should be able to go in and, and talk about the engines, educate, you know, the people that are watching on TV, because for the most part, all of the people that come to the races that end up getting up and leaving when Pro Stock shows up, they still watch the TV broadcast, you know, whenever we aren't racing in their area. So if we can educate those people, you know, while they're sitting at, at home watching on TV, then, you know, maybe next time that they're at the, at the racetrack, they'll sit there in the stands as well. Uh, with that being said, even the, the announcers there live on property don't really do us a lot of favors either. You know, after the Nitro Cars run, they, um, we've got pro stock in the water box ready to fire up, and they're already telling the fans, you know, Nitro will be back up. The show will resume in, you know, an hour and 45 minutes from now. Last I checked, the show was still on, you know, so they're, they're embedding this in the fans' minds right then and there that, the show's over um if you want to go get a hot dog go get a hot dog because it's just pro stock running and you know i've worked my whole life to be able to do that uh, to race pro stock and it's it's uh 
over the top offensive more than anything, to be honest. I, look, man, I agree with you. When I look back as a kid, when I watched drag racing, sure, fuel was great, but I wanted to see Pro Stock. I thought Pro Stock was the most fascinating class. Love Pro Stock. I can remember Warren Johnson doing tire tests at my home NHRA track, which was Atlanta, Georgia. And it would just be a regular Saturday, the bracket race program going on. And the fans would, would fans, drivers, all of us would fill the stands just to watch him do a half hit in a pro stock car. And somehow, some way, somehow that interest has seemed to go away over the years. And I agree with you. I really think the NHRA has got to hype up the show. Y'all are a part of the show. Bring in some West Buck World Door Slammer National flair to it and make y'all definitely a part of the show. You're not just filler. Let me ask this. Let me do a rundown on a few things. Do you think modern pro stock could be ran with a more stock appearing body? Is it possible? Can the drivers handle the car? Would it make the cars too unstable? Because that is one of the biggest disconnects I regularly encounter with fans is, well, they just don't look like the cars I'm used to. Yeah, you're right. And they don't, you know, a lot of people even say that, you know, the, the factory stock should replace pro stock. And those, while those cars are cool, they also just aren't as cool to watch. They don't, they don't run 200 miles an hour. But again, if you understand what that car is, what it weighs, what they have to work with and what they run in a quarter mile, it is absolutely impressive. Um, all it comes down to, man, is, is I think it's just the uh, the educational side. There's no doubt that people like to be able to um, relate um, to a car. You know, that's one of the reasons that the Street Outlaws stuff does so well. That's a totally different different category more than anything. You know, uh, Pro Mod, for example, one of the reasons it does so well is because it's just so diverse between power adders, the bodies. You know, even though nobody can relate basically to a pro mod with you know with a 1471 blower sticking out of the hood you know or a thousand and something cubic inch nitrous car but it is it is fun to watch and uh they're unpredictable um but you know anything that you could do to, to a pro stock car to make it more relatable is I'm going to say it, it could be a slippery slope. It could go either way. It could, it could help, but if it does anything, like even slow the cars down at all, um, I think that people are just going to lose, lose interest. All right, man. So I'm a Ford guy at heart. One reason why I'm wearing the Bill Elliott throwback hat. So as a Ford fan, yes, there's Ford bodies in pro stock right now, but you know, there's not like a Ford factory packed team. What needs to happen in NHRA Pro Stock for the climate to be favorable for new manufacturers? And, and when I say new manufacturers, I don't mean just Dodge, Mopar, Ford, but, you know, a Toyota, uh, a BMW, whoever else might want to come in and run NHRA Pro, Pro Stock. What's got to happen for that climate to be favorable for them to come in? Man, it's that's a that's tough too. You know, uh, Toyota, for example, they're already in Top Fuel. You know, they work with those guys, uh, the TRD team. I think that they would be a a good candidate um, to come out with the Pro Stock platform. Um, maybe like the the new Supra body. You know, there's there's a ton of different options and avenues there. Um, it's just uh, more than anything, it's just money. And if if you know, back in the old days. The theory was when on Sunday, you know, uh, buy on Monday or sell on Monday. And the, the thing is, is it just, it isn't quite like that anymore. And it may be because we are so disconnected from having the cars that, that are relevant um, to what the actual cars look like now. Um, it would be cool to see somebody like Toyota or BMW or anybody um, get in, but even, you know, we've got, we've got stuff that's easy. Ford, for example, uh, Dodge and Mopar, for example, those, those are right there. They're heavily involved in racing already. Um, even drag racing, you know, you've got Bob Tasca that's got a Ford, uh, sponsorship. You got the DSR guys that are heavy, heavy Dodge and Mopar, but nobody supports pro stock. And, and all it comes down to is money. Chevrolet is the only company that, uh, 
that actually supports the category. And that's why everything is Chevrolet based. It's the only thing that any of the teams can afford to do R and D and, uh, and to be able to make horsepower is because Chevrolet supports it. Um, since the other, other categories don't, it's just too expensive. And, uh, you know, the bottom line with all of this, no matter where you go, it's money, you know, for, from a manufacturer standpoint to an engine developer standpoint, it all costs something and you got to have the money to be able to do it. So, with Pro Stock, let me ask on the fan experience and to you, a driver, what do you think as racers, teams, they're in the pits, how Pro Stockers can improve the fan experience? Now, I'm not saying the fan experience isn't great, but literally, what can Pro Stock do to pull some people from the Nitro pits down just a little bit further and do some more interacting with all of you guys? You know, I think, I think a good start was when NHRA implemented having to back the cars into the pits, um, leaving the engine exposed so that people can see what the front of the car looks like, um, you know, what the intakes look like for the most part. You know, a lot of the manifolds are, are covered, but you can, you can see a lot more of the car. Nobody wants to look at the taillights of the car and everybody working on it, uh, you know, up at the front. Um, it is cool that they do allow the fans um, to be down in the pits right up to the ropes to be able to see the cars up close and whatnot. As far as what they could do um, to make it better, you know, sometimes it's even just, just the parking. And I know that, that it's limited uh, from track to track on where we can park, but there is often times that we are, are very, very disconnected from the nitro pits on one level, we appreciate that because it's much quieter and we don't have the nitro, you know, blowing through our pits. But on the other aspect, you know, the fans need to be down our way as well. Um, so it just depends on, you know, they could do stuff in the midway with as far as um, things that they set up that, that draw more people down to the pro stock uh, pits and whatnot. But I, w I will admit the bottom line is that we do have um, a lot of people come by at least our, you know, our pit between Erica, Jag and I, um, we've got people, you know, standing, you know, four or five deep pretty much daily um, at the back of our pits, uh, wanting to see the cars and, and see what, what we're working on and whatnot. So with that being said, we at least do have a lot of passionate fans that do come to see us. Definitely do. Definitely do. There is a, a contingent of the elite motorsports nation, as it were, pulling for all you guys from Erica, Jaggy, Aaron, uh, you know, Marty to yourself. So there is definitely that contingent out there. And it is good to see, you know, you mentioned parking, you mentioned, you know, sometimes being near Nitro and not being near Nitro. Give me an example. What track on the national trail is a prime example of parking and what track is an example of wow i wish we were a lot closer but we, we are really disconnected something like Topeka, kansas we are as far away from the nitro cars as we could possibly be uh basically on another planet um then you've got let's see something like uh even pomona we're we're pretty far away phoenix we're pretty far away um the gators and and gainesville it's pretty close um you know, Pro Stock Motorcycle, Pro Stock is real close together, and then we're just right out of the, off the side of, of the Nitro cars there. So every track, like I said, is different. Some are better than others, and, and some are worse than others. All right, Alex, I've been talking about Pro Stock, and we can continue to talk to you about Pro Stock for a good long while, but that's not all that you're involved in in the world of drag racing. You've got Pro Stock, you've got the radial, attempting at least to get into the no prep and pro mod. Talk to me. What makes each one of those so challenging? So start with me, Pro Stock. What's so challenging on down through radial, no prep, and to the pro mod? So the Pro Stock car, you know, I, I first I say people, people always ask, you know, what's the difference in Pro Stock and Pro Mod? And I say Pro Stock is all about uh, perfection and Pro Mod is all about survival. And that is 100% the case. Uh, the Pro Stock car, while it does take a long time to be able to learn to drive the car and to make a decent run, once you have it, uh, it isn't hard. It isn't a hard car to drive. 
it is hard to drive perfectly and that's what it takes. You've got to be killer on the tree. You have to react on every single shift point consistently every single time without shifting early or hitting the chip because either of those will result in a, in a huge uh, ET loss um, or gain for that matter. Um, and you just, you have to be perfect literally every single time because if you aren't, there is no catching up. It isn't like racing the carts on a road course or oval course or anything where you hang a wheel off in the grass and make a mistake and you can catch back up. In the pro stock stuff, if you make one mistake, you lose, period. Um, the pro mod car, they are not hard to drive, but they are, um, they're, they're scary. You know, I'll just be completely honest. They're uh, borderline terrifying, especially getting used to it and starting out. Um, you know, zero to 250 something miles an hour in five and a half seconds is absolutely insane, especially with the short wheelbase and, uh, you know, being stuck between two doors, it's a, it's a whole, a whole different animal. Um, once you either, either, you know, get the, the courage to be able to drive it or, uh, one of the screws in your brain gets loose enough to, to do it, uh, they aren't hard to drive. Um, you know, for the most part, you, uh, you know, push the button on the steering wheel, uh, put it on the chip and let off the button and the car goes down the racetrack. Um, with that said, I think that a, there are a lot of people in the category that shouldn't be in the category. They can afford um, to race and they can afford the cars and everything, but they don't necessarily have uh, the skill that they should have um, to, be, to be able to drive a pro mod. Um, because like I said, they're easy. If they had to shift the car on their own or something, that would definitely separate um, a lot of the people in the category. But for the most part, you let off the button, the car shifts for you, uh, you're responsible for pulling the parachutes at the end of the track. And uh, from there, that's, that's pretty much it. The car does move, wiggle, you know, it'll drive all over the racetrack. And there is a fine line. It will take a lot of inputs, uh, you know, steering wise um, to be able to recover the car and still get it to the finish line. But the problem is, is that almost every single crash that, that you see in pro mod where somebody hits the wall or turns around backwards or gets upside down, it's all driver error. Um, rarely is it something that was a uh, mechanical problem or a problem with the car that resulted in a crash. It's, it's typically because people don't know where that line is and, and they cross it. So my theory also in that category is leave the starting line first so that I stay as far out in front of them as possible the entire run. Uh, then getting into the radial car, it's similar to ProMod. However, that car, I still shift myself. A lot of those guys don't, but one of the things that, that I like is to be in control of shifting because if the car is going into tire shake and you can shift it early, or if you need to shift early or shift late, um, then that's, that's up to you and that's your decision. Um, stepping back into the ProMod Topeka last year, um, the, I left the starting line in first round. It drove out about 100 foot and went into tire shake. I pedaled it, but for that one tenth of a second that I was off of the gas pedal to back on, the car shifted. When it shifted while I was off the pedal, it just grabbed all that extra gear ratio, sent the tires into the most violent tire shake. Um, when that happens, the, the windshield basically is shaking and vibrating so hard that it turns solid white, you can't even see. And then next thing I know, I turn and smack the wall. Um, you know, again, even though I was dogging some of the drivers in ProMod, that was a driver error. That's something that I did. I crossed the line there. Um, but I also will blame the automatic shifter on that because if I had to shift it myself, I would have either hit the chip trying to save the car. Um, I, I know for a fact that there would have been uh, a different outcome. Um, but uh, that's why I keep the automatic shifter and the radial or the um, manual shifter in the radial car so that I'm in control of it all at all times. Uh, that's, that's one of the things for me, even like roller coasters, riding with somebody else, even if I don't know, flying on an airplane, for example, even though I'm not a pilot, I feel like I would trust myself better than I trust, you know, whoever's in control just because I just, I'm kind of a control freak. Uh, but uh, I would say that's pretty much the difference 
and everything. The radial car does, you know, a killer 60 foot um, and runs, you know, three, you know, basically three and a half seconds to the eighth mile. Um, we don't really stretch it out to the quarter. But with that being said, I do want to sometime. The way that the car is set up, I've used hardly any of high gear uh, before half track. So I would like to plug high gear sometime and just stretch it out to the quarter mile and just see how, just how fast it'll go out there. So with these door cars, and you mentioned Topeka, Topeka, there was absolute carnage in Pro Mod round one. And Pro Mod recently has seen some terrible, terrible accidents. There was, you know, several cars that made a beach visit in Orlando, and uh, Stevie Fast Jackson wrecked his car. And Pro Stock, when y'all get out of shape, it's probably the wisest thing to click that thing off because if they get out of shape and get any air under them, they roll, they tumble. And the radial cars are getting some serious air now, and I've never, I never thought we'd see the days where a door car would basically be doing a blowover. But we're seeing those type of things. Do you all in these door cars, do you ever get together? Do you talk with engineers? Do you talk amongst yourselves and say, you know, we got to figure something out to keep these cars on the ground, whether it's vents or, you know, roof flaps technology like from NASCAR. Is, are there any of those type of discussions going on to keep the cars on the ground? That's a good question. Um, the bottom line is, is that's a decision that the drivers have to make and they have to make it quickly. Um, for example, uh, like whenever my Corvette last year at Sweet 16, um, the radial car, you know, did a massive wheelie. You know, I had to make the decision to lift at some point before it, you know, flips over on its roof. I didn't have the wheelie control and all of the electronics that everybody else has. But, you know, since that, since then, you know, um, Fuel Tech has worked with me and we've got wheelie control on it now. We've got traction control. So there are definitely um, not complete fail safe devices, but it's, it's cheap insurance for sure. Uh, Marcus Burt's crash, for example, um, I'm not sure. I would certainly assume that he has some type of wheelie control on that car. Um, but the thing is, is you have to set it. Um, you have to, you have to pick what you want um, timing, like how much timing you want to come out as the, as the car comes up. So you may set it where when the car comes up five inches, it pulls out a half a degree of timing. When it gets to seven inches, it pulls out a full degree. When it gets to nine inches, it pulls three degrees. But so that's going to be completely up to the tuner to decide on what those numbers are. And so the bottom line is it may have just been coming up faster than what, uh, what the car was responding to. So the bottom line is electronics or not, you can't always rely on it. There has to be a decision to be made, you know, whether you stay in the gas or not. Um, and, uh, the bottom line also is that do you want to race the next round? Do you want to race the next weekend? What is it worth tearing up the car uh, versus, you know, just a round loss and being able to load it up in one piece and go home? So that's the question everybody else really has to ask themselves. Man, look, we know you are a tough competitor. You're the 2019 U.S. Nationals winner. You won the World Door Slammer Nationals in Pro Mod. You won a Lights Out event. So you're a tough competitor out there in the drag racing ranks. Tell me, for Pro Stock, Pro Mod, and in the radial scene, who do you count as your toughest competitor in each of those classes and why? You know, I would say in, uh, in Pro Stock, it'd probably be a toss-up between – Jag and Erica, um, they they both are typically very consistent on the starting line. They're two of the best drivers in the in the entire category and the history of the category. Um, and with all of their success, um, it's definitely you know I, I try to always say that you know when I go up to race, I turn on my top bulb, bottom bulb, stage the car the same every time, regardless of who's in the other lane. But there is no doubt that statistically they make. They make really good runs and they're very consistent. So I know going up there that I can't make any mistakes. So I'm going to say they're, they're definitely the two, uh, two heavy hitters in pro stock. As far as pro mod goes, you've got a lot. You've got, you know, uh, the Tutteros, you've got uh, Stevie Fast. Um, you know, he came, came into NHRA pro mod swinging. He's had a ton of success. Um, you know, he's got, he, he does a good job himself for the most part, but then you've got, 
um, you know, his tuner too. And uh, that guy, man, he's, he's, he's one of the best that, that has ever lived. Um, and, uh, but hey, Stevie pays for it for sure. I know that, that, that there's a, a heavy price tag on, on that deal. Um, but uh, probably, probably between those two um, and altogether, any of the Pro-Line cars, man, they're, they're all top, top dollar cars. You know, they have spared no expenses on anything. And uh, Eric Dillard at Proline does a really good job uh, keeping keeping them, you know, well fed as far as as far as horsepower goes, and they they run a top notch operation. Um, as far as uh, in the pro mod category, they are as professional as it gets. You know, um, they've they've got it down um, from from putting the awning up to to making you know number one qualifier runs, um, and then going over into the radial category man there's there's some guys that have kind of come out of nowhere too um that that are heavy hitters obviously stevie fast is is probably uh the best one that that there is in that category as well um but uh in drag racing man anything can happen so it doesn't matter you know back whenever i won at uh lights out 10 last year racing the pro charger car um from pro line he was making the best runs all day, all weekend. We knew that whenever we met up in the semis, that we were he was going to have to either break or red light or something, and he went red. Um, on that same run, the crank trigger on my car broke, and I, you know, was like two tenths slower than I should have been. And so, you just never know; anything can happen. And so, even if you're, you know, the cards are against you. You still got to go up there and stage the car and make as good of a run as you can because you still might win. So, Alex, look, you've been trying to get in the no prep scene, and you have done some no prep racing, but, you know, the the outlaw no prep guys, that's a whole rabbit hole, and I've tried to explore it. It's been utterly fascinating. So, look, talk to me about this. How have you dealt with really the visceral of the situation? I mean, that inflamed and got big and kind of nasty and, you know, Reaper this and this guy that. I mean, how did you handle all that and how are you handling it now? Will we see anything in the future and some of these races actually throw down the money, get thrown around and some things come to conclusion? You know, I realized early in uh, my racing career, especially professionally, uh, that not everybody is going to be a fan. It doesn't matter how good you are, how humble you are, how nice of a guy you are. The bottom line is some people just aren't going to like you because they don't want to. And that's that's a choice. Uh, and, and that's totally fine. Um, the, the no prep scene, of the fans, for the most part, a lot of them absolutely despise me. Um, and because of that, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll admit, I, I pick at them some uh, or a lot, but, uh, you know, it's all in good fun. All, it all just stems from whenever I was with Gas Monkey and we did the build where we raced against the Street Outlaws um, in 2017 and 2018 or 2016 and 2017, one of the two. Um, and, you know, being being affiliated with Gas Monkey and Richard, everybody just assumed that we had the best equipment and the best of everything and, and, and the, that the Street Outlaws guys were the underdogs. And that really wasn't the case at all. We were the underdogs. Uh, it's a long story on that, but that was their TV show. We were just trying to live in it there uh, and, and make the best of it. I had a good time doing it. And, uh, you know, because we were on their show racing against those guys, you know, on, you know, with their, with their own fan base and their own fan following, we were the bad guys and that's the bottom line. And so that's, there's no doubt that that, uh, you know, is a contributing factor as to why, you know, some of the, the no prep fans, uh, you know, don't care for me too much. As far as the racers, I get along with pretty much all of them. Uh, you know, Reaper, yeah, whatever. He he's is what it is. Uh, I'm not bothered by any of it. Uh, whenever he makes his videos and stuff, you know, calling me out or or whatever he's doing, he's he's genuinely upset. He is he's mad, and my video responses are just sarcastic. And I just kind of 
just make fun of it more than anything. Uh, so I don't take anything to heart. I've got pretty thick skin and uh, you know what, it's, it's just one of those, you know, parts of it. But um, I was actually listening to a podcast recently from uh, Nico Rosberg. Uh, he's a, uh, he's a 2016 formula one world champion. And uh, he hits the nail on the head when he talks about um, like your public perception and, and how heavy it can be because you're always being judged. Everybody on the outside is judging you in one way or another. It could be positive, it could, it could be negative, but every single thing you do, everything you say, people are judging you. And, uh, and it, there's no doubt that, that that can be a heavy feeling. So everybody you know, deals with it differently. Um, people, people will write, um, you know, they'll comment things, they'll send direct messages and stuff, just saying some of the most hateful stuff, you know, which I don't, I don't understand. I've never scrolled through Facebook and seen something that I didn't like. And I wanted to like comment and just tell the person, you know, how much I just really, really dislike whatever they commented or posted. Um, if I don't like it, I just scroll to the next thing and, and that's it. But not everybody's wired that way. And you know, it is what it is. But like I said, I've got thick skin and just move, move right on past it. Folks, look, a professional driver can still have a bad day. They're human. And every now and then you might find Alex having a bad day or someone else. And it just happens. Maybe you have a bad interaction. Because it always shocks me, Alex, in social media, how someone will badmouth an individual. And it's this one moment. And they've taken and exploded this one moment. You know, look. I've had a couple of drivers in the NHRA deny me interviews. I'm like, okay, cool, fine, I'll go on and I'll talk to Alex, you know, or whoever, and get an interview. And I've had people, even though I'm this YouTubing hack that is a nobody, cuss me out, not know a thing about this. Like, what are you doing? So it's absolutely bizarre. But, man, look, like a duck, glad you let the water roll off the back. So I've got to ask this. You're a man – that has been behind the wheel of a lot of different types of race cars and different forms of motorsports. Your thoughts on people who make statements like this? Well, real drag racing is no prep. Oh, NHRA sucks. Or real racing is NASCAR. People want to quantify that real is associated with one brand. What's your word on that? Man, to be unpolitically correct, <laughs> those are the people that don't have real teeth. You know, like they, th those are some of the most just like backwoods, just like hillbilly, God knows what. I mean, these, these are people that look like they came from that movie, uh, The Hills Have Eyes. You know, you click on, you click on their profile and they've got like, like half of their face cut off or like, you know, like they're living in their mom's basement, you know, Donald Long always, you know, calls them Cheeto eaters. But dude, the bottom line is like, they are just like some of the, the worst human beings on the planet. So as far as taking anything that they say, uh, credible, it is not. So that's one of those things that, that you just have to brush off to. I used to, you know, I used to let it bother me. I used to engage with them that, that they don't know what real racing is or, or whatever the argument could be. But the bottom line is now, you, I mean, you just, you just look at these folks and uh, they're just a different breed of uh, incest humanity. <laughs> well, there's the word from Alex Laughlin on those who have got particular branded real racing. Oh my. I did say uh, speaking... unpolitically correct. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm speaking... usually very politically correct. <laughs> Speaking of non-politically correct, look, Elite Motorsports has a interesting connection to a worldwide Netflix phenomenon in Tiger King. So, look, give me your thoughts on Tiger King the documentary and explain to us as well the Elite connection there in Oklahoma. Well, it isn't directly connected, but it's as close as connected as you could ask for or want it to be. Uh, directly across the bridge on I-35 um, is is the Tiger King's uh, castle. You know, um, it's it's literally a quarter mile from the front door of the Elite Motorsports uh, facility. And I was up there last weekend, 
and I've driven by this place probably a dozen times. I've seen the fence and stuff. I never really knew much about it or thought any, anything about it uh, until I started seeing uh, about a year ago uh, Joe Exotic's uh, presidential campaign videos. And man, what a character to say the least. Um, because of the, the tie and the connection there, when this show came out, I absolutely couldn't wait to watch it and just learn the whole story. I've heard stories of this and that, and pretty much every single story that I ever heard was on the documentary. Um, it's definitely a train wreck. It's entertaining. Um, and uh, there is no doubt, no doubt in my mind that uh, Carol Baskin killed her husband. <laughs> There's the word from Alex on, well, we all know that individual, Carol. So as crazy as the show is, I've watched it myself. I, actually, I took your recommendation on watching it. I decided to watch it. And yeah, wild story, dude, wild story. Now, I've also seen some pictures of apparently they would bring cats over to the shop occasionally did you did y'all did you yourself ever get to hold a tiger cub i did not but um you know apparently richard freeman is like a distant cousin to uh joe exotic and uh you know joe joe would bring over uh the cats from time to time or, or one of his people would and yeah there's there's pictures of the guys in the shop with with baby tigers uh there was one of them that that went in richard's office and he was petting it and it actually and it bit him you know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it's just, I mean, that's just proof that, you know, they, they are animals and, and I mean, you can't completely trust them in this show. Joe explains that the pistol that he carries with him is for people and not the animals. But as soon as uh, one of those cats has a hold of his foot, dragging him across the, the lawn there, you know, he uses the pistol and at least fires a couple off in the air to, to scare the cat enough to let him go. Dude, it's always shocked me that there are big cat people out there because, I mean, a little little nice domestic cat, you're petting it, you're, everything's fine, and all of a sudden out of nowhere, it hauls off and bites you. And, you know, a tiger is a tiger. I mean, it's a killing machine. Maybe it's playing with you and it kills you. It's like a mouse to a cat. It's no different. I've, it's always shocked me, big cat people. Look, man, let's, let me dive in to this let me round off the interview with this little pop culture uh top three with a racing question so man give me your top three comedies as far as movies give me your top three songs and we'll end with your top three motorsports heroes okay man on the music side i am lacking i for whatever reason can't tell you hardly the name of any bands like a song comes on I may know it I couldn't tell you who sings it what it's called or anything uh, I would say that the majority of what I like is anything that uh, that's like the new hot thing that it just I don't know just kind of has a good rhythm and beat to it or whatever some so many of the songs these days don't even make sense uh, they just put a bunch of words together that rhyme uh, movies though Man, uh, absolute number one is going to be Billy Madison. Uh, I like that one. I like Dumb and Dumber, um, Happy Gilmore, you know, and then all the way up to like Step Brothers. I know that's that's four, not three, but that's just good, good comedy. You know, I, I like to laugh. You know, I, I think I would much rather watch something funny than something uh, that uh, keeps you on the edge, edge of your seat or that's sad. You know, that's who wants to watch a sad movie. Um, but uh, any, anything that's funny, and then uh, uh, as far as uh, iconic drivers, man, uh, you know, really, I, I've recently been very inspired by Nico Rosberg and that podcast uh, that I listened to. Um, he had a lot of good things to say, and it, and it isn't just about racing in general. It's just, it's just also about life, how you handle things how you process things about failure and what it takes uh, to succeed. And just, uh, just based on what, what he had to say there, um, there were some, there were a lot of powerful uh, thoughts and, uh, and I, you know, I appreciate it because he isn't just, just a wheel man, you know, he's, he's a, he's a deep thinker and, uh, 
um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I always look way past, you know, so, so much more than uh, just what's on the surface level. Um, I've always been a, a fan of Jed Coughlin Jr. You know, he's a, who would have thought that now he's my teammate. My first race out in Sonoma, California, uh, it was like second round of qualifying. I'm still terrified. You know, I've made one lap so far in a pro stock car in front of people on national television too. And, uh, you know, Jake was standing by his car and walked out of his way and came over to introduce himself. And man, it was so cool when, whenever he did that, 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 I mean, I legit had like tears in my eyes. I'm, you know, I'm, I literally, I'm just meeting the dude and, and I was starstruck and, uh, you know, it's just almost getting emotional there right in front of him. Um, but, um, you know, he's one of the best guys that you'll ever meet. Um, and I'll be a fan of, of his for life. And then, you know, go on to, to uh, somebody else, you know, somebody like, uh, like even Dale Earnhardt from NASCAR, man, he's, he's a legend and, uh, and he'll always be a legend um, on, on and off of the track. So uh, there's, there's a lot of good people. I'm a huge fan of John Forrest too and, and everything that he's done. You'll never, he's a 16 time world champion and, and you'll never ever in any of our lifetimes see somebody else be a, a 16 time world champion it, and you may not ever see it again for the, for the history of the sport. And, uh, I think that's more realistic than anything. Bob Barker. I hate that guy, but <laughs> we definitely like Alex Laughlin here at drag racing TV brought to you by shrugmasters.com folks for Alex. This is Lee Kraft. I'm the Monday morning racer drag racing fan until next time. God bless and keep the pedal to the metal. Oh, <laughs> no!